Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm, my name is Martin Philipson, and as Dean of the College of Law, I'd like to welcome you to our 2018 Wunusway Lecture in Aboriginal Law as part of the College's McKercher Lecture Series. As we gather here today, we acknowledge we're on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nation and Métis ancestors of this place, and we reaffirm our relationship with one another. I'd like to thank the various individuals and corporations who've donated to the Winnesway Lecture Fund, including the Honorable Judge Gerald Morin, who's here with us this evening. I'd also like to acknowledge McKercher's law firm for being the sponsor of the College of Law Lecture Series. Without their support, uh, we would not be able to present a wide range of informative, educational, and entertaining speakers to the law school and the wider community. Our speaker this evening is Marilyn Poitras, a familiar face at the College of Law and has been an assistant professor at the college since 2009. Marilyn is mischief Irish and an alumna of both the Program of Legal Studies for Native People, now called the Native Law Center Summer Program, and the College of Law, graduating with her LLB in 1994. She also received a master's degree from Harvard University in 1995. Marilyn is a student of indigenous legal traditions and has worked on ancestral domain and indigenous land issues throughout her career. Her legal expertise spans constitutional and Aboriginal law, as well as negotiation on indigenous land issues, both in Canada and the Philippines. Marilyn has worked with traditional teachers across Canada and within communities to create, discuss, and design opportunities for indigenous participation in Canadian politics. She has developed a number of legal education and initiatives, including the precursor to the Kitsurak Law School in Nunavut, where she was also a professor, and the Indigenous Peoples Resource Management Program here at the U of S. Marilyn also served as a commissioner to the federal government's National Inquiry for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls before stepping down in July 2017. Please join me in welcoming this year's Winnesway lecturer, Marilyn Poitras. Hi, everybody. I, um, <clears throat> I want to say thank you to the people who have created the Wanesway Lecture. It's really, really important in the time and space that we're in right now in this country that we have spaces that are specifically dedicated to issues that consider Indigenous people and our voices. So my hats go off always to the people who contribute to that and make it possible Thank you so much to uh, the people who support me and love me no matter what I say publicly that are in this room right now. Thank you so much. Um, I usually when I ask, I'm asked to do a lecture, I try to figure out sort of who am, who am I talking to, what am I talking about, and. This lecture, this Wanesue lecture, um, my husband and I were having a debate. My husband's a fluent Cree speaker, so you can imagine how well I was doing in this debate about what Wanesue means. And so I started texting Jerry on the side to say, what do you think about this? And what do you think about this? And so I was getting some private tutoring lessons in Cree on my cell phone while I was having a debate with my husband about what Wanesue means. And so if Wanesue means setting, setting the law, determining the law, setting the structure, I want to think about how we do that. And I want to think about how we do that together, which we don't do very often. I've been involved in the legal system and working in courts and jail cells and shelters and land issues and women's issues and children's issues since I left high school, actually. You can do the math. And uh, I am amazed every time how I'm often one of the only indigenous people in the room that's talking about issues uh, that concern indigenous people, conferences, lectures, workshops, is often about Indigenous people and what should be done about issues surrounding Indigenous people and not with Indigenous people. And that's been something that's been, I raise that issue on a fairly regular basis every time I speak. 
So I wanted to, for any of you who know that I stepped down from the commission for reasons that I felt that the commission was going in a direction that was, um, had already been traveled, that had already been done and, and we hadn't really taken the lessons from that path. And so I wanted elders at everything. I wanted indigenous process where we come together in ceremony and we talk about who we are and where we're going and we give thanks for who we are to start so we all kind of get ourselves on the same page. And I didn't want to talk about all the reports and studies and statistics that had already been covered and done. I teach, I've been teaching for over 20 years, and I've been teaching out of those reports the entire time. I've participated in other systems that look at those issues. I know what those issues say. And um, I didn't want it to go that way. I wanted it to have a real indigenous foundation. But we don't have a whole bunch of examples about how to do that. So when I was asked, and I'll be frank with you, I was asked when I was a commissioner if I would do this lecture, and I said, absolutely. I would just be talking about what the commission is doing, and giving you a big update. <clears throat> and then July came, and I wasn't going to be a commissioner, and so I had a conversation with the speakers committee. Should I still talk? Yes, I did feel like I had something to say. In the course of the last two or three weeks in our province in particular, in our country as well. We've had some pretty uh, life-changing moments with Indigenous people in the justice system. And so as I prepared to do this speech and have this conversation, I had to think about what we're going to say and how we're going to say it. So um, one of the teachings that we have is circle teachings. And this can sound really simplistic and how's it gonna go and what's a circle all about. And I know that there are some elementary school teachers who have teaching treaties in the classroom curriculum that actually just think you're gonna sit in a circle and talk about the circle and pass an instrument around in the circle and talk. But circles are much, much bigger than that. Circles have many, many, many teachings to them. And part of it is that it creates an even playing field. And when you're all sitting at the same level, you're learning at the same level, and it's, it kind of forces you to take off the credential and maybe leave some baggage and participate in a different way. And when I first started working at the university in 2004, uh, we had, um, it was Aboriginal Day, and the Tim Neatby Theater had just been renovated, and we had invited Harry LaFond from the uh, Office of the Treaty Commissioner to come and speak. And we got into this brand new, re newly renovated space, and he said, oh my God, like, is this the only way you're ever going to create a space at the university? One person will teach everybody and it's one speaker and then we're not learning together and are we going to create spaces where we share information rather than having a lecturer so katie was setting this up where's katie and helping me try to figure out how could we have this be you know circle ish so you're in a circle ish right now because, you know, we're only part way down the path of truth and reconciliation, so this is a circle-ish. We'll eventually hit the circle. And then I thought, how can I teach you something tonight about how we could share information, maybe in a different way? So I'm going to share something that I had teachers that have taught with me at the university since I started. I've always, always had elders that I teach with and teach with me and that learn with me. And two of those elders are Simon and Alma Kaitwehat, and they are past now. But we had a big meeting in Saskatchewan, and we invited um, politicians and deputy ministers and police and social workers and uh, chiefs and counselors and academics and lots of elders to this meeting. And they started with a fire ceremony. My little token of the symbol that Simon and Elma taught 
taught us that day. When you sit in a circle, you speak to the center. You speak to the center of the room. And they lit the fire and they had a ceremony around the fire to teach us to speak to the center of the room. And when you speak to the center, you are given permission and the space to speak your truth. And whether somebody agrees with that or not is none of your business. It's your business to speak your truth. And fire is a symbol of rebirth and renewal and energy. And so when you speak and you speak to the fire, you're offering your experience up. Now, when I speak to you tonight, something that I say might come and stay with you and sit on your lap or your shoulder. It might make you laugh. It might make you angry. It might make you sad. It might make you hopeful. And that is your lesson to take or not. You can leave it with the fire. You choose whether you take those home with you or not. Sometimes Simon would teach when something follows you home and you kind of can't get rid of it and it keeps waking you up and it's in your computer and it's in your dreams and it's following you around, Simon would call those rascals. And the rascals might follow you because they're teaching you something. And so I'm offering this little token of a circle-ish and a fire to say, I'm speaking to that fire today to share with you the experiences that we have. Now, what, what is our truth? <clears throat> I said that I was going to talk tonight about shape-shifting, making space for Indigenous process within the politics of Canada. Now, what is shape-shifting? You might conjure up images of somebody turning into another animal, another person. When, when would this be used? How would we use shape-shifting? Well, shape-shifting is a process that comes from a traditional practice of the hunter, the scout, the messenger, the shape-shifter changing shape to become part of the scenery, to become part of the landscape, not detected, not detectable. And the, the reason that the shapeshifter is there is to find the truth. What is the truth about what I'm about to do? What is the truth about the hunt I'm about to undertake, about the war I'm about to undertake? What is the truth about the ceremony I'm about to take? Now, shape-shifting might seem like something that is shamanistic and we don't practice very often and might not even be uh, active in our communities. But I'll tell you that in the Sundance ceremonies that uh, our family goes to, the, the shape-shifting is still part of that ceremony. The center pole that is the, the, the piece, the center of the Sundance Lodge is hunted people go and traditionally would even dress up to go into that space to select that ceremonial pole that is the center pole, the king pole. Ogimawatik, Ogimawatik, the king pole, the center pole. The shapeshifter is seeking the truth of the landscape. What are they facing, as I mentioned? to select perhaps a tree that's to be sacrificed for the ceremony of the thirst dance, where spiritual commitments are made. The participants of that ceremony are in the sun dance to suffer. They suffer for the lessons that they'll take on. They may make offerings for relatives that have gone on ahead of them, but they're there to suffer. So what happens then to have, what do our shapeshifters reveal when they go into community like that? What does a shapeshifter look for? Well, they look for the truth, as I mentioned already. 
So if we have shapeshifters in our community and they're looking for the truth about how to make sta some space for indigenous process within the politic of Canada, what do you think they found? What, what have they seen? And I can talk in a lot of detail here, okay? There have been literally thousands of reports, papers, articles, studies and inquiries on indigenous people, justice, social issues, police, healthcare, and so on. Thousands. We have indicators on the standard of living for indigenous people within our borders. It's not a pretty sight. We have a commission that took place on residential school and the residential school experiments with all the sexual, physical, intellectual, cultural, and emotional abuses that were found within the residential school system. We have statistics on the rates of incarceration and recidivism. We have rates at which children have always been and continue to be taken from Indigenous families. We have numbers on homeless, and overcrowding in Indigenous homes. We have high rates of tuberculosis and diabetes. We have data on addictions, addictions to sex and drugs and alcohol and pornography and even abuse. We have numbers about high school and elementary school students, dropout rates, and the incredibly low graduation rates. We can talk easily about the number of dollars that are sent out to reserves and the incomes of chiefs and councils. We know the amount of welfare paid out through social services to Indigenous people. We know the cost of jailing people, putting them in foster care, and the cost of scooping financially the children from our communities. We've also written about the number of times Indigenous people have been raped, abused, mistreated, which incidentally in our courts shows their propensity to do it again and again and again. We count dollars misspent and mismanaged and stolen by chiefs and councils, trustees and directors. We have numbers on women living in poverty and who experience violence. And of course, we're now attempting to count the number of indigenous women, girls, two-spirited and transgendered people that suffer, that go missing and are murdered. Maybe between two and 5,000? Whose stats should we use? The RCMP or NWAC? This is the Canadian way. This is what we do. We collect data to create a significant numerical result to justify spending money on a problem. That's what we do in Canada. That's how that works. It's how we justify most things, actually. A rise in the crime rate in certain communities requires more money, more police in that area. Our schools have more students with problems that are indigenous. Will they need more resources? More cases going through our courts? We need more judges, more lawyers, more jails, and larger courthouses. That's how it works. In the statistical mathematical exercise like this, the provincial and federal treasury boards meet and they hear the pitch for where money should or could go based on this numerical information. The story about how indigenous people are a problem is well documented. I defy you to find an area that we have not studied the problems of indigenous people. When I hear that indigenous people are the problem and have problems, and the issues, even colonization, the ugly, amorphous, decontextualized monster under the bed has contributed to Indians are the problem. I feel sad, I feel anger, and I feel uncomfortable. I feel those things because for me as a half-breed, my experience with violence, with politics, with the justice system, 
and with the Canadian state is that I am the problem. Indians are the problem. Inuit are the problem. And the stories that are attached to that thinking, to that conclusion, are that we, as Indigenous people, are the problem, and it's a perception that Indigenous people of this country don't have the capacity, cannot fully participate as parents, as students, as employees, and as political actors within the state process. The story that is attached to this is that Indigenous people just keep falling between the cracks. We keep meeting over and over and over. What do they need? What do they need? What do they need? The healthcare system, the justice system, the education system, the political system are failing Indigenous people because we are somehow deficient. There is, in fact, some old anthropological writings that conclude that there were no social, political, or economic structures here among indigenous people at the time of the world's colonization movement. We're just nomadic and like showed up and existed day to day in each other's lives. Today, we create a new story about indigenous people being communal people. That's the new language around Indigenous people. Our rights are based on a communal legal ideal of what non-Indigenous people think communal existence might mean based on some anthropological information. There are some early Jesuit writings, actually, that discuss that Indigenous people here were like the flora and fauna of the, of the geography of the landscape, and that's how they were described, exploring places and looking much like the deer and the birds in the landscape. There are also, on our Canadian landscape, some judicially modified cases that say the land was empty, uninhabited, terra nullius, and there's a doctrine that applies to this empty, vacant space indicating the land had been discovered. Other court cases have created the legal fiction that the crown acted honorably when dealing with indigenous people and the original inhabitants, because without that critical piece, without the honor of the crown, you pull the thread of underlying crown title on all the land in this country and it unravels like a badly woven rug. You have to presume honor of the crown for our current system to operate. To continue on with the story attached to Indians as the problem, we have a discipline within Canada called Aboriginal law. Aboriginal law that sets out the way Indigenous people will access any legally recognized rights that exist because of the signing of treaties, because of the places there are no treaties, and because through political negotiation there was a demand for a recognition of those rights. This Aboriginal law discipline was born out of non-Indigenous law practices and documents. The early days of the Royal Proclamation, when the king proclaimed how England would take over this land. The British North America Act that set up the division of powers and set section 9124 as the power head where the federal government would control and deal with Indians and lands reserved for Indians. And we're all Indians now, just, so you, just to keep you up to date, we're all Indians now. The Métis are Indians and the Eskimo are Indians because a non-Indigenous court has held that that's who we are. There's a common law, of course, that contributes to Aboriginal law and Section 35 of the Constitution that creates the recognition of existing treaty and Aboriginal law. The principles to protect, advocate, and act as the fiduciary for Indigenous people litigated through cases that have relied on these instruments that I've listed have all contribute, contributed to creating the story 
that they determine the way in which people participate. Indigenous people participate, get access to, come through the door under certain conditions. The systems and the politics of this country have certain protocol. People must use, Aboriginal people must use the language of the courts, the same courts who have seen us as deficient, wards of the state, incompetent, and who have created the legal fictions that I've talked about, decide whether we get access to places in which dis discussions are completed to allow Indigenous people to participate in justice, in their families, in defining their citizenship, in resource revenue sharing, in accessing treaty and Aboriginal rights, and on and on and on. There are certain ways to get access to that. And don't forget that really Indigenous people have only been litigating for about a generation, right? It was illegal to do it before that. And so there's, although we've got a fairly large and growing body of Aboriginal law, it's not that old. <clears throat> so our shapeshifters have seen many, many things about Indigenous people and how Indigenous people participate. But this list, these studies and reports and inquiries and articles is a view of the world through a lens that sees us broken. And it's not complete. It's not the whole picture. This view of Indigenous people has no heroes, has no sheroes has very little hope. The shapeshifter would only see problems lived by people who are suffering. So what is missing? Why aren't we looking at all of it? What don't we ever talk about and why? Those are the kinds of questions that I asked myself before I walked into the commission forum. We have all of this stuff. What don't we have? We don't have contributions made by Indigenous people. I really, really want to read that report. We may have a Cree or a Dene, or a Salish, or a Nuvialuit Malala living among us. We may have one. But that young woman has been through foster care because most of our kids are taken. She is now demanding to be heard and refusing to be the sexual sponge for foster care parents or the police or the local predator, and she's decided to defend herself. Many more indigenous girls are going to jail now than ever before. Is it because they're bad? Or because they stood up and said, you are not going to do this to me anymore? What is that statistic telling us? She says, I won't stand for rape. I won't, I won't put up with the institutionalization of my family or me anymore. And if she says it too loudly, and if she has children, they will be taken from her. And if she's not careful, they will not come back. And as we see in the case that's unfolding in Manitoba of the woman who has lost her children to foster care and has had a decade of building her life around trying to get her children back, we'll see that when she gets her 16-year-old back, he has to be in jail by 9.30, and if he's not, social services is coming to get him. Like, I have a 13-year-old that I can barely get to bed by 9.30, and it's a negotiation process, and if he was going to be taken from me every time he decided he was going to bed at 10 or 10.30, I would not have a son right now. How about you? She's taken to social media to talk about what's happening to her, so she was told while she has her children, she cannot go on social media. There's this little thing about freedom of expression that rings a bell somewhere in somebody's life, in somebody's law, in somebody's constitution that doesn't sound for her. 
Our incarceration rates, as I mentioned, are going up. And I want us to think long and hard about what that means. And I want us to go to those girls and ask them what it means. There are no studies on the people who live among us who feel and believe that they are absolutely justified to live in fear and protect their property with handguns. There's no studies on that. Whether or not there are statistics and data to justify the fear that your, your property is in danger from the local indigenous community, there's no data on that. That's a prejudice, a stereotype, and racism, but we're not allowed to talk about that because that makes people uncomfortable. The pimps, the racists, the abusers, the murderers, the types who prey on the vulnerable, I want to read a study that talks about him. I want to read, how was he raised? Who are his parents? Grandparents, neighbors, how were they raised? How is it that children who are in our community legally incapable of consenting to sex, stimulating that rapist? that murderer. How is that possible? I want to understand that. What are the family dynamics of somebody like him? Where are the rituals of those teenagers that include things like raping a sex trade worker in your community is a rite of passage of a young man? This is information that was shared with me during the Pamela George trial in Regina 20 years ago. We are dealing with a community where non-Indigenous men have grown up that this is the ritual. If there are any such studies about male abusers that do this kind of thing, they're Indigenous male abusers, typically. We do study that loosely. And those reasons say they will be violent, they'll continue to be violent, they're aggravating factors for whether they should be released or not, so we keep them in jail more often and longer, where they are educated about how to commit more crime and stay in jail, and no help exists even when it's asked for. And the chances of them going back to jail are, of course, significantly high. Now, of course, we're trying to count the number of women and girls and two-spirited and transgendered people that are going missing. We don't really study it intentionally. We're kind of struggling with how do we know if they were indigenous or not? We think they were. Where do we go for that data? How are the police collecting that information? We're not very sure about that. Who should be collecting that information? Whose job is that? As I mentioned before, we might go to the uh, Native Women's Association of Canada and ask them what their stats are, and there's some women in the country that have actually been going around the country collecting that data to see how many thousands of names they can come up with. But if we could statistically gather that data, what is the number that's the tipping point? What number is too many? Is it 500? Is it one? Is it 10,000 or 20,000? What number do we need? Because we know it's not just Indigenous women. We know it's all women. And we know from a little campaign called Me Too. And we know that human trafficking is reaching really high levels in our country, and it's an issue we don't talk about or look at. So who should be doing that? There was a system one time, this is, I'm dating myself back about 20 years now, there was a system in the province called the Wraparound Project where the provincial government had actually looked at how to wrap a number of services around a family so that they weren't falling between the gaps all the time. And it was phenomenally successful. They had a little workshop, it was a five-year project, they had the kids come and testify, mom who now had a regular home, the kids were doing well in school, mom was flourishing, and uh, lots of great things to be said about it. 
I went to the deputy minister at the time and said, you know, I think it would be really worthwhile to, to take the opportunity right now to look at our criminal justice system and say, could we stop collecting all of the factors that are the worst case scenario in this kid's life and maybe look for their heroes and their dreams and their aspirations and who their safe space is and where they can find themselves? And the deputy minister at the time said to me, Marilyn, we can barely keep up with the work that we're doing right now, finding out what the problems are in their family. We certainly don't have time to be looking at that. <clears throat> We do not study where our people and our communities thrive, where we have families who are healthy, where we feel safe, where they love their work, where the community loves them back, or how many people have grandparents in their lives to help raise them, how many grandparents and mothers and aunties and uncles have kept the language alive. How about our ceremonies? We don't have any studies on that. How about the people who are leaders in their communities and their schools and volunteer at the hospital and relied on by neighbors and friends on a pretty regular basis? That's not what we count. We do not study or account for the amount of money that goes out in subsidiary payments that we never would call welfare payments, but go to non-Indigenous people who have struggled and have reasons to ask for assistance and have government programs to assist them and their families. We don't call that welfare, and we certainly don't study it. We don't study the amount of money that comes out of developed Indigenous land, goes into the federal government coffers, and then gets rerouted, which should be rerouted back to the indigenous community, the First Nation community, but often is, uh, there's money taken off and it's put through a few back doors and sometimes the money goes back into the community and sometimes not. And some of that money that comes from legitimate business development on that First Nation, because it happens through the fiduciary relationship where the federal government's in charge of that money, is their money and they have to report for it and request it and they never get all of it back. And nobody talks about that. And I'm not talking about a few thousand dollars. I'm talking about millions of dollars. And we never account for that. Where's the forensic auditing on how much money goes out of First Nations communities? Where's the forensic auditing on how much money First Nations spend in our cities, in our towns, and support our local businesses? I'd like to read that, actually. We don't study the amount of revenues brought in by provincial lands and resources, which are, the subject to, which are subject to treaty, part of traditional territory for indigenous people, and the myth that those lands are passed to the crown and lost to indigenous for, forever is part of the story that we've accepted. We don't study the schools who retain and support and graduate indigenous students at very high rates. We never study that. We do not study where indigenous communities have taken back control of their social and political structures and are thriving. There's communities in our country right now, and I actually am not gonna name them because they don't want any repercussions. Communities that have said, you will not take our children anymore, you are not allowed in our community. And the federal government has had to sit down with them and say, okay, okay, How's this going to work? There, I've taught students over the last 20 he years here at the university, and one particular First Nation, so I was very fortunate in the uh, lands program to teach students from all over the country, had developed a sand and gravel business, and they were a, it was, it was going to be a very profitable business. And once they got it up and running, the local um, provincial highway traffic board stopped their trucks every morning for four hours and inspected them from bumper to bumper in order to stop them from being able to participate in this new endeavor. It went on for weeks. They finally gave up and said, we're never going to be able to do this. We are losing money daily. We can't afford to keep the people employed. So I really hesitate to say names of communities where there's successful things happening because there could be repercussions. Isn't that ridiculous? We're not going to celebrate successes? We don't study the women in jail, on the street, or in foster care and say, what do you need? You know, 
if you're going to go to the men at the College of Law and ask them what the women at the College of Law need in order to feel safe and included and able to participate there, I would be pretty upset about that. I think the women at the College of Law have the best idea about how they could feel, they could participate and be engaged and, and, and participate in the, in the college. And I think the same thing happens for Indigenous people. Uh, the women that I met over the last year and a half that came to the commission absolutely have ideas and names and times and spaces where they're safe and where they're not safe. They know. There's retired police officers that have volunteered and said, we know exactly how to help with this issue and where the majority of the problems are, and we could do that. That doesn't seem like rocket science. Instead, we collect in our own safe spaces and we theorize about the condition of the indigenous people in this country. We pontificate about the numbers we have collected and then consider what should be done next. How much should we spend on them? We extrapolate because those people would not have a clue how to fix the situation, or they would. Clearly, Indigenous people would be better. There's no indication that if those in charge of our social systems, our justice systems, our correction systems, knew what the problem was and how to fix it, that we would be fixed by now. A lot of time and money has gone into those systems. We should be living in utopia, utopia lifestyles by now. As I mentioned earlier, we don't study racism. It makes people uncomfortable and defensive and closed to new ways to work together. We do not see the Indian problem as a way in which Indigenous people are the industry for corrections, for social services. In fact, Indigenous people are not the only ones within the population. Coincidentally, we are just the majority. We do not ever study the times that Indigenous people have used the created Canadian institutions, processes, and systems to find justice, to find a place or a space to participate. We do not study that. We do not study the fact that our justice system is founded on the protection of property, primarily property. If I could put a picture in your head about all the laws that exist in our country, predominantly they are created to protect property. There are a few laws that pertain to people. And you would think that the human rights area would be predominantly that space, but more likely than not, the people that, um, Big M Drug Mart is the first case that comes to mind for me in terms of the drugstore that said, you can't make us shut down, and we got, we've got a lot of corporate sort of things happening in terms of how you access, human, you access rights to participate and freedom of religion and things like that. Um, if you bring a race, racism complaint to a human rights tribunal, they will openly tell you this is one of the most difficult cases to prove. Instead, instead of looking at that and how to heal, we continue with a legal fiction that it is a system that is blind, objective, and impartial. That if indigenous people only tried harder, if Indigenous people just tried more often, if you were better, you would find a voice within our systems. You would get access to justice. Access to justice is another incentive to keep us as Indigenous people reliant on and participating in the justice system that has never been intended to be a healing, inclusive, just process. It's a punitive system. Criminal law is about punishment. It protects property primarily. We do not study police as abusers. And we don't study police who serve and protect and actually make us safe and give us the space to find ourselves. 
We don't study any of that. We do not give enough attention to the fact that our, our kids make it through foster care systems. Their self-esteem is usually so low by the time they exit, they are dead, suicidal, in a gang, on the street, or new parents themselves looking into that cycle. We never study that. We've got some communities that have looked at it. We've got some indigenous CFS agencies who have written about it. But it doesn't stop the social justice, the welfare system from saying, this is probably a bad idea. It, it's an indication that the system actually doesn't work. Why are we not talking about that? It's okay if it doesn't work. Let's figure out another way. We don't study how many promises are made on political platforms that are not carried out, that fall short, or don't make the Treasury Board cutting room. We never study that. We don't study youth who are paying attention and participating in commercial, social, and justice systems. And we should, we really need to, we really need to look at our youth and their participation and who's participating when and how. We do not study indigenous laws or practices that assist people in finding a space where they can take on responsibilities, parent, understand their role, know the meaning of reciprocity, of humility, of courage, of wisdom, of family. We don't study that. We don't talk about things that exist, like the early Jesuit writings who were like, what the heck, these indigenous women actually think they own property and that they have a say. There's some writings from the early 1600s that show that some of, the, some of the early explorers came and it took them sometimes over a year to convince indigenous men to beat their wives. We don't talk about the fact that some of the feminist movements that started early back in the day came from an understanding that indigenous women had rights and they were participating in the governance and social structure and were heads of families. We don't talk about that. We don't study the tradition of women holding a place of prominence and being the creator, the relationship that we know women have with creator. We don't study the roots of the ancestors of the early settlers and the wars and the riots and the witch hunts that were part of their generations, we don't study that. We don't study the fact, or we think we're past, I, I, I don't wanna you know, stretch this too far, we think we're past the discussion about women as property. You know, that, was a, that was strongly looked at in the, in the early days of the feminist movement and, and we know that lots of legislation was around that and sort of breaking free from that, but we don't extrapolate those principles and say, is that what's happening with indigenous people? So we don't study a lot of things. And do we need to? Do we need a study? I have reached a point where I have thought about this for hours and days. I've put a career into it, frankly. Uh, I think we've recommended enough. I think we've studied enough. I think the tool that we've been trained as Canadians to ask for is an inquiry. Let's get an inquiry. If the government gives enough attention and time to this issue and money, we will know that it's been taken seriously. Millions and millions and millions of dollars. It's used to put off dealing with the issue, dealing with marginalization, dealing with demoralization, exclusion, condemnation of indigenous people. Throw large sums of money at it and ignore all the past studies and our data will show that we've put a lot of time and attention. <clears throat> our children will not be given back without something changing drastically. 
No study required. No money will flow as a result of the black stock decisions. I think we're up to four now. No study required. Property is more protected than the lives of indigenous people. No study required. Indigenous women are subject to violence and murder and go missing and are put into human trafficking circles at a higher rate than any other collection of people in this country. No study required. Dropping people off outside the city of Saskatoon in the winter with no coat at night will kill them. No study required. Politicians will respond first and align first to property owners and voters who support them. No study required. Litigation. Cindy Blackstock's entire career has been dedicated to going after more resources for children on the same footing as non-Indigenous families. No luck. I mentioned at the beginning of my talk that I've been looking at this issue for a long time, over 30 years, and inclusion is not one of the principles that we strive for in talking about Indigenous people and the issues surrounding Indigenous people. It's just not. We figure it out for them, because of them, and I want to be really honest and say I don't have answers. I don't have the answer about how to do that. But I have a lot of ideas and I have a lot of people that I think I could bring to a conversation. And I have a lot of places that I would like to look for information to figure out how to make this participation joint and meaningful. I'm not afraid of failing. I'm not afraid of trying something and doing it badly and getting it wrong because it, it can't be more wrong, it can't be more harmful than it already is. I'm very, very hopeful about the youth in our community. When you come out to the truth and reconciliation discussions that are happening in our province, you will see Indigenous youth there participating fully. You will know that the University of Saskatchewan has the highest Indigenous student population in the country. We are becoming educated and included and demanding voice. When my husband called me to talk to me about the Bushy decision, we were both kind of just quiet on the phone for a while. And you could feel a crack in the world that day. And I wondered why. What, what's the crack? What, what are we feeling? And he said to me, there was never an expectation before that we would be treated equally. There was just an assumption that we wouldn't. And now there's an expectation that we will. And so you can't unknow that. You can't change that. And I don't think the families in this province or this country are going to ever turn around on that. I think the crack is here. And I think the Truth and Reconciliation contributed to that. At the early days of the commission, we were told by a group of elders that the Department of Justice in Saskatchewan had put together. They met with us, there was about 14 of them. And they said, if you're here, to rip us open and ask us about the horrible way we've been treated and all of the horrible things that have happened to us and our daughters, our sisters, our mothers. Please don't bother. We've, we gave. We gave for Canada. We gave and gave and gave. The rates of suicide, domestic violence, turning back to drug and alcohol, addictions, 
after that were quite high and they weren't interested. And so where do we go? How do we get this information? How can we do this? Alan Asobomsawin is about 80 and she's a filmmaker. And she's been making films on indigenous issues for her entire career. And the last movie that she worked on, I was in Montreal and I was meeting with her because Tasha Hubbard and I had created a little film called Seven Minutes about a young woman, an indigenous woman in Saskatchewan who was stalked leaving Syast one night, a nursing student, and the support that she didn't have and the assumptions that the police made that he was just a nice guy and he was just thinking she was pretty. Um, Alan Ace was helping us doing the last bits of this film and she's done so many films. She got a job at the National Film Board as an indigenous producer there and director and she was allowed to have the position as long as she's alive and she still gets up and dresses to the nines and is ready to take on life every single day and goes to the National Film Board. And she told me that for the first time in all of her years of activism, that she sees hope. That our youth are coming through this. That there's a generation of young people that are taking over and want to participate and will not be told no. Now if Alan Asobomsawin, who's lived through this, and told as many stories as she can tell, sees that there's hope. Who am I to say that there's anything but hope? She's been examining this with a microscope, the treatment of indigenous people. She is a shapeshifter. She said, something's coming. So I believe that. The elders that I work with in our community are raising their own children to say how, how to contribute and when to contribute and that they have to contribute, and they are. I know that racism is learned. If you read the really old studies of the blue-eyed, brown-eyed um, study in the United States of the teacher who was teaching at the day after Martin Luther King was shot when the teacher was teaching young people in her classroom about what racism feels like, and she broke them into blue-eyed and brown-eyed groupings, and. The blue-eyed kids were the good guys and the brown-eyed kids were the bad guys and pretty soon by lunchtime everybody had figured it out and we're starting to, to um, um, comply with the new order. She switched it around after lunch and the kids went home and told their parents all about it and they told how angry they were and how awful it was. And she's done, that, she's done that study several times. It's about 35 or 40 years old, I think, and she's done it several times, and she speaks all over the world on that. And it's uh, an eye-opening experience every single time she does it. And it only takes one day. So now if you think about generations of people making assumptions and the racism, the racism that goes both ways, I'm not naive. Um, where that comes from and how ingrained it gets. If you can do that in 24 hours, or the high school student, high school teacher that said, I'm gonna teach you about Nazi Germany and what it was like to be one of the selected ones and did a five day experiment with his students. And by day five, there were students coming from schools across the city to participate and be one of the chosen one. It had spread like wildfire, blew the guy away. His wife actually said, shut this down. You're making it crazy and I don't recognize you anymore. Students were afraid to say anything about how they were being treated by their colleagues. It doesn't take very long. So if it doesn't take very long to learn about racism and how to be racist, it, do, it shouldn't take that much longer to learn how to get along, how we're gonna do this together. Saskatchewan has one of the highest rates of community participation in truth and reconciliation forums. But I want to leave you with this. Truth and reconciliation is a really hard job. It's a muscle that we don't exercise. And if you don't exercise a muscle, it does not develop. And if you want biceps or a six pack, every day, you gotta do, a, you gotta do that work every day. Rip that muscle every day day. It's hard work. It's uncomfortable. It could even be painful. 
but that's the only way you develop that muscle. And so, Mr. Bushy and Ms. Fontaine have put us all into a workout room together. And it's not comfortable. And it's not going to get more comfortable. But we have to do the work. You've been very, very patient about listening. I want to say thank you so much for coming, sharing some time tonight when, I guess you can't watch the Olympics, but the Paralympics are on. That would be awesome. And you came here instead. And I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Poitra, Marilyn. I use the name Marilyn very sincerely. My sister's name is Marilyn, too. And she has ruled me for a long time. You know, back a few years ago, when I envisioned this lecture, it's to have the interaction that we need with each other. And today, I see many faces I don't recognize and that's good, because it's never to try and convert the converted, but also to welcome those to the circle. It's important that we interact. It's important that we know each other. And it's important that we continue to interact. We are in this together. We will always be here. You will always be here. How we chose to live together is a choice we make. And it's a choice we live with. And when we hear the things that Marilyn talks about, that is what we need to strive for. It is not more studies, but to understand where we have come from and to listen to what we have to say because we need to have a say in how we change things. And that's how I have always looked at this lecture and how it came about was when a friend of mine said to me out of something bad comes something good it was through a bad experience when I was projected in a certain way of being a uh, an abuser having destroyed a room and uh, they put my picture on the national news, and I was 2,000 miles away. I had an alibi. It was perfect alibi, because I was nowhere close to where the thing happened. But when that money came to me, I felt what my friend said, out of something bad, should, something should, good should come about it. And certainly, when I was a student here 30 years ago, in the College of Law. I struggled, but at the same time, I made many friends in the practice of law. And now, sitting as a judge, I make lots of friends. And every day, I talk to many of them in many capacities. To teach, I think I try and teach. I push. And the things I talk about are all the time our inclusiveness because it's important. So with you people here, it justifies that. And I welcome you, and I appreciate your attendance. And certainly the many contributors that have helped, some of which are here today, it's important. And I will continue to push, because I believe the answer is amongst us and together. And what we hear tonight are not subjects that need to be easy, as Marilyn says. It's not an easy subject. But then life isn't either. So I appreciate it. And Marilyn, we have a small token here. We appreciate your talk. 
And it is important that we keep having these discussions. Thank you very much.